Hello for love, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. Oloingo o Susana Suisuiki. Coming up. The priorities for our communities haven't changed for the last 20, 30 years. New Zealand's major political parties are vying for two ticks from Pasifika come election day. Also, Hawaii's homelessness crisis worsens. And later... The problem becomes how do you enforce that with academics who perhaps don't think it's their responsibility. New Zealand University sets deadlines to eliminate disparities. The final day of business for parliamentarians in Aotearoa, New Zealand, has wrapped up before MPs officially hit the campaign trail. With the country's election day fast approaching, two of New Zealand's major parties are already going head-to-head, serving up a range of enticing policies. Our Pacific Issues reporter for Election 2023, Lydia Lewis, spoke with Nationals Shane Reti and Labour's Kamo Sepuloni to find out what they're offering. National and Labour are vying for two ticks from New Zealand's Pacific communities. Cost of living. Health, education. Transport. Wage growth. Youth offending. These things matter. Both parties say they've consulted with Pacifica on what matters most, but one main issue has already been pushed to the side. This is much more complicated than what people realise. We haven't nailed this yet, but we are continuing to do work on it. That's Labour's Carmel Sepuloni talking about an amnesty for overstayers. She's confirmed no decision is to be made before the election. It's not looking likely that that can happen before Parliament dissolves. But what we have committed to is continuing to do the work. We said from the start, this is not off the table. A kick in the guts for Pakelau Manase Lua, a staunch advocate for an amnesty and the communities he serves. The priorities for our communities haven't changed for the last 20, 30 years. Poverty is a huge issue. Housing, they're all still huge priorities. However, what's even more important is what do governments show to our communities that show that they are meaningfully here to care for us and to do the things that we want, including things like supporting the overstayers who are here. What are you doing to help them? They're the most vulnerable people here. A national-led government would not back an amnesty for overstayers, something their Pacific People spokesperson Shane Letty has made clear. We've looked at this and we're not generally in support of an amnesty for overstayers. We think that would send the wrong message, particularly to all the migrants in New Zealand who are doing the right thing and following the protocol. So our current policy settings are that we're not supportive of an amnesty for overstayers. What National is focused on is addressing the cost of living, transport and health. Ms Siriti says Pacific Health providers are part of National's plan. But I just can't tell you at the moment. So just hold your breath here a moment. I support our Māori health providers, our Pacific providers, and that primary care is vital to the health system going forward, and I will back that with policy. I just can't tell you here today. Watch the space, be pleased. Labour is still very much in the watch the space phase of the election too. We haven't released our manifesto in relation to Pacific peoples yet. That will spell it out really clearly when that is released. But for the last six years, we've been very much focused on the challenges that Pacific communities face, health, education, and these things matter. So many of the policies that we've implemented over the last six years have had a direct benefit on Pacific peoples. How would Pacific communities benefit by voting Labour? Well, certainly because we continue to be focused on low- to middle-income households, uh, not the wealthy uh, voters at the top. How would Pacific communities benefit by voting national? Several things. First of all, we're very good economic managers and uh, will bring stability, a laser focus on dealing with inflation, which corrodes everyone's financial position. Pacific communities make up more than 8% of the population in Aotearoa, an all-important figure come October 14, Election Day. Hawaii's high rates of homelessness and housing costs have become highlighted in the wake of last month's wildfires, which devastated the town of Lahaina in Maui, leaving thousands homeless. It's exerted more pressure on Hawaii's government to address the issue. Fina Fonua has more. We don't have enough houses for our people. It's really that simple. That is where we are, and we are struggling and suffering because that is the case. If anyone says this isn't an emergency or this isn't a crisis, 
They are not aware of what's going on in Hawaii. That was Hawaii's Governor Josh Green on July 17th, addressing the press following his issuing of an emergency proclamation pledging to build 50,000 houses before 2025. In 2022, Hawaii recorded the fourth highest rate of homelessness in the United States. Close to 6,000 people are homeless in Hawaii. It's also the most expensive state to buy a house and has the second highest mortgage rates in the country. According to Hawaii's Senate Housing Committee, an average of 14,000 Hawaiians leave the state every year. Green says the mass migration is causing a lack of skilled labor. If you need a nurse, a lot of times you can't find them because we don't have a house that they can afford. If you need a firefighter in an emergency, they may be on their second or third shift back to back because we have too few of them here in the state. If your child needs a teacher and they don't have one in their classroom and it's a temporary teacher or a sub for the third or fourth year in a row, it's probably because we don't have enough teachers in the state because they can't afford housing. If that's not a crisis, if that's not an emergency, I don't know what is. Maui attorney Lance Collins knows all too well the social impacts of Hawaii's housing crisis. He works for the Progressive Movement of Hawaii, an organization dedicated to helping local residents fight off evictions. Collins says reforms are needed as expensive housing has long characterized the state's economic landscape. He says the term housing crisis is a misnomer, calling it a deliberate mechanism of Hawaii's economic system that goes back over a century. The territory of Hawaii and the state of Hawaii has passed law after law after law saying that there's a problem of affordable housing and they come up with potential ways of solving it. Um, some have been very useful and then for some reason were not continued and others have not really been very helpful to address the shortage. Um, but in my view, I don't see it as a crisis. It's part of the structure of our system. Um, and so until the system has changed, uh, we're unlikely to see an abatement of the shortage of affordable housing. Collins is skeptical of pledges by the Hawaiian state to build more homes. He says only a systematic reform of Hawaii's property market and laws will solve the problem. It's not a supply issue, and the so-called emergency proclamation is not limited to building affordable housing. In fact, there's no requirement that any of the houses that are built be affordable under the proclamation. So if there are 50,000 luxury homes that are built through this proclamation, that's not going to in any way address the shortage of affordable housing. And in fact, by creating so many new luxury homes, we may end up in a situation where it further exacerbates the shortage of affordable housing. It's an issue that's been exacerbated by the devastation caused by wildfires earlier this month. Thousands of people were left homeless after fires destroyed most of Lahaina, leaving 115 people dead. Controversy arose as thousands of locals slept in gymnasiums, church halls, and their cars, while Maui's many hotels catered to tourists who continued to fly into Maui. It took three weeks for the state to eventually move over 6,000 people into hotels and Airbnbs. Governor Green said in his latest updates his government was doing everything to support the evacuees. There are 19 hotels that have stepped up, another 1,100 people in Airbnbs. This is gonna become very central to our response because we wanna get people about 18 months of housing. We're working on that right now. We don't want anyone to become homeless as a result of this. This project goes to the more permanent housing. You'll see a lot of individual assistance getting approved. 4,232 individual assistance applications already approved by FEMA. But a number of people from Maui have told RNZ Pacific they're uncertain about their future. Apart from losing their homes, they've also lost their jobs as a result of the disaster. Donata Lolosio, principal of Sacred Heart School in Lahaina, which was destroyed by the fires, says some of her students and their families have already left the states. The the situation out here is dire. I mean, the displaced people are moving from hotel to hotel, some, you know, in days. So the housing is is a crisis. And the the tourists, 
have all been sent home. So now there's that issue with the economy. They're in a living situation where they're always having to move from place to place. So they're, all that they own is in their little backpack. Hawaii's government has pledged to rebuild homes, but a time frame is yet to be announced. Some universities in New Zealand are reluctant to set deadlines for eliminating long-standing disparities for Māori and Pacific students. For more than a decade, Māori and Pacific students are failing courses and dropping at a higher rate than other students. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. The Tertiary Education Commission says a range of biases and disparities combine to underserve Pacific and Māori learners. Eleven years ago, it aimed to end disparities by 2018, and when that didn't work, it set a goal of 2023. That didn't work either, and at universities last year, Pākehā students had a course pass rate of 88%, with Pacific students well behind on 69% and Māori on 80 Now several universities, and Te Pūkenga's polytechnics, have told the Commission they'll eliminate the gaps within six or seven years. Rosa Hibbert Schooner from Temana Akonga, the Māori Students Association, says big changes are needed. I'm not super optimistic. I think we're starting to see some real good change and some real good efforts to work collaboratively with Māori students on the national level, but I can't say the same for our local students. Every time they come to our hui and come to our different wāranga, they're still facing the exact same challenges. She says universities need to listen to Māori students and actively involve them in planning and governance. Auckland University academic Seriana Naepi says the long wait for change is getting longer. Some of those dates are pretty far out, right? So what does it mean to tell a population that you've got to wait six, seven years for an institution to meet parity? That for me I think is concerning when we know that this is an urgent issue and it's been an urgent issue for decades. Dr Naepi says universities and lecturers will have to start doing things differently. The problem becomes how do you enforce that with academics who perhaps don't think it's their responsibility to teach in ways that provide equitable outcomes. We have people who don't reflect actively on their teaching practices, and so you have to find ways to incentivise academics. AUT and Waikato University are not keen on setting deadlines. Waikato says a third of its students are Māori and Pacific, and it's committed to parity, but a deadline would be arbitrary. AUT's Vice-Chancellor, Damon Salesa, says it's being asked to solve disparities created by society at large. Students come to us with highly variable preparation for university and with an already existing parity gap often within that student cohort. So we have to be really sensible about how we address this and make sure we're we're recognising the challenges that students have. And those challenges don't come into universities equally. He says the Institute is working on a target date, but COVID has made disparities worse. Canterbury University has set a target of 2030. Its Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Catherine Moran says things are already changing. What I see is real ownership, actually across our faculties, across the academics. People want the students to succeed. They don't want to be part of the problem. They don't want to be creating barriers that are going to impact the students. She says measures include redesigning courses, contacting students who might be struggling and paying students to mentor others. Meanwhile, the Tertiary Education Commission says it can withhold funding and set conditions if it's not happy with institutions' plans. That's Pacific Waves for today. Don't forget you can listen back on rndi.com slash programs. We're also on Apple, Spotify and iHeartRadio podcasts. From myself and the team here at RNZ Pacific, to fast so far.